uh, of those places. So I'm uh, speaking to you from Tacoronto or Toronto. Um, it's uh, been home to many, many people over the years, but the territory is, uh, it's Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, uh, and Huron-Wendat. Um, and it is governed by, uh, or it's subject to Treaty 13, which is the Toronto Purchase of 1805. Uh, meanwhile, Zoe is in Shokshoge or Montreal, um, and uh, that is Ganyenge Haga territory. It's unceded territory. Um, both uh, Takaranto and Shokshoge are, uh, were part of the Dish with One Spoon uh, Treaty. Um, and then, uh, Last but not least, we've got Conundrum, who uh, they are in Mi'kma'ki, um, in what's more uh, more recently called Nova Scotia, and uh, that is home to and looked after by the Mi'kmaq. Um, it's also unceded territory. I imagine that we might have some people listening from from other places on like in Turtle Island and uh, regardless of the specific legalities and treaties that apply to those places, it's stolen land and uh, a lot of us present are settlers and occupiers. Um, anyway, there are some really great things about being able to do this remotely. Um, like I probably wouldn't get to be here otherwise, but um, it tends to, I don't know about you, but for me, it like blunts my sense of of place a lot, right? Like I don't, I don't feel especially connected to the idea that we're all in the same place right now. So uh, I think, um, especially if you've never done this before, it uh, it'd be great to maybe take a few minutes when you're done listening to uh, just think about um, where you are, what the place is properly called, uh, who the land properly belongs to, and maybe if we kind of all do that together an added bonus side effect will be that we feel a little bit more like we're, like we're together. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So on that note, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Zoe, who also is going to have some interesting things to say about places, I imagine. Um, and yeah, you've got a little presentation prepared for us, right? Yeah, um, so I was going to like show a presentation that I did in the spring um, for a bunch of librarians <laughs> about the book that was kind of about like the research that I did. Um, and so I'm going to show some sketches and stuff. And then yeah, we're going to chat. So let me just get my screen share going in a way so that you don't see like all of my tabs and everything. In the wrong place. I'm so excited. Uh, so I guess yeah to start. Uh, is this the book? Um, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, it's or if you haven't read it, it's about um, the Romanov family who were the last um, royal family of Imperial Russia. So it was really, really interesting to like, even though it takes a very like fantastical turn. Um, a lot of what is in the book is really like rooted in research that I did that was super fun to do. So can you guys see a picture of some people in the olden days? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the picture of the Romanovs. Um, and there's like a huge photo archive of um, the Romanov family. And like, this is kind of the sort of picture I thought I was going to find when I like started looking into it. Um, that's like a very formal portrait of them. Um, but part of what is really, really interesting about them is that they took a lot of like their own family photographs. And this is like the very early 20th century um, for the kids, I guess, like, yeah, the, the parents were born in like the late uh, 19th century. So it's like this very like formal portrait, but a lot of the pictures of them are just like these very casual family photographs. And I think they're like very, very um, affecting and just like not kind of picture that you would see of um, these like incredibly powerful people a lot. Um, how do I click to the next slide? Oh yeah, so this is like um, my favorite page of the book, maybe. It's one of my favorite pages of the book and this is like 
that kind of portraiture. Um, but then these are like some of the photos that I found. Um, this is Anastasia, who's the protagonist of the book and most famous from the movie um, Anastasia, the anime, the kids movie, but there's been like a ton of other art um, about her, which I sort of avoided reading and looking into too much when I was working on this, because I sort of felt like it would color it a lot. But um, yeah, this is her dad letting her smoke a pipe, which you probably shouldn't let your 10 year old do. Uh, and this is her wearing these crazy false teeth. Um, and that's one of her sisters, I'm not really sure which, um, in the background. But she took a lot of these photographs, which I find like really, really interesting. Um, yeah. And I just got really, really into looking at them because there's this whole part of the internet online um where people who are just completely obsessed with the Romanov family have spent a lot of time like compiling all of this it's a site called Alexander Palace where you can like find just huge amounts of information and I got really interested as I was working on it in like both why people were so interested in it and how much people were clearly able to like really project a lot of themselves um, onto this family because even though we have this like huge record of them in a way there's like not a lot about them because they were um, pretty private at least in their lifetimes um, like it's sort of hard to get a sense of those people I find um, this is a royal menu this is like an actual one um, that I found it's like written in French because a lot of their communication was like actually in French uh, at that time they also spoke French um, and then this is like some drawings I was doing different food that they ate um uh, that's a typo but Sakuski um is like this these sort of small Russian finger foods which I have to try sometime um yeah and like the trout which was like on one of the real menus and these different kinds of cakes and stuff um yeah, and then here's the final page that that turned into. So it was a little typo there, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so as I was working on it, I was like starting with a lot of these kind of primary documents and then like trying to integrate the details a lot into the story. And that's where like I put a lot of my um, concern with historical accuracy is the small details um, because the story like really veers wildly from um, what happened. Um, yeah, this is this like slide that they had in the like children's playroom. This is, I guess actually not, this is probably not the playroom, but maybe this room must have been near the playroom because it has the kids toys in it. Uh, so they had this crazy slide uh, just in the middle of the palace and this like car um, for Alexi, which I found really interesting and um, in this panel we have him going down the slide in the car which would probably be um, I mean he'd probably run into a wall but I really had the image of him doing that when no one is uh, paying attention they're just in this big empty palace um, oh yeah these are these very cool like colorized photographs um, so I was looking a lot at like the furniture and just sort of trying to get a sense of like the light in a lot of these pictures I found to be really beautiful and trying to make some of that come across um, with the techniques I used. So all of this is drawn in two layers. There's one layer that's like uh, black and white inks and that is the dark blue. And then on top of that, all of this texture um, is pencil and that's drawn on a transparent piece of paper. And then they're both scanned, put them into the computer together and this is what you get. So I didn't really see the final effect of a lot of the pages or any of the pages until I kind of got to the end and started putting it in color, um, which I really enjoyed. These are costume sketches. Um, I did a bunch of planning so that I would get the dresses consistent because I found it pretty hard to like hold in my mind. Um, I found about, about these really cool felt winter boots that um, I guess a lot of people were wearing in Russia at that time that are I think, kind of traditional. Um, they were pretty fun to draw. Um, yeah, and just like some little character sketches here and a scene breakdown. Uh, so this stuff is really old. This is probably from like 
five years ago now because I worked on this for so long. Stopping and starting. Um, and then there's a lot of, there's a book online that's of all the uh, royal jewels. And I really loved, I love putting those on black backgrounds. So these were so compelling to me. And then um, there's sort of this whole element of the Romanov uh, story where they had sewed all these jewels into their clothes. And then when they were executed, it stopped them from dying quite so fast because they were basically wearing armor, which is just like a very haunting detail to me. Um, yeah, and then you can kind of see how the, these, that, um, I'm sorry, the jewels from that book, like this kind of format made it into the, the panel structure. We have the sewing, um, kind of a Whistler reference. Um, oh yeah, and then this is the creature in the book, which I really had a lot of fun designing. Um, who runs around in his fur coat and his boots and is following her around. Yeah, and then this is kind of like the thing that started it all was this photograph, um, which at the time that I started the book was kind of making the rounds online a lot. I think that there was, I'm going to say the wrong thing, it might have been the Atlantic or something, had like an article about it. People were like, I think talking a lot about art, um, like selfies being art and um, like, yeah, we're very interested in this photograph. I think it's so compelling. Um, so this like kind of became the cover of the book, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, but then I also found these ones and I really got deeper into the research, which I think are so great. Like they're so awkward. <laughs> um, she's clearly figuring out how to use the camera. Um, and yeah, I sort of like wanted to bring some of this feeling into it as well. I think there's just one more slide. It's a short little presentation. Oh yeah, and then here you can see how it you know, became the cover. So yeah, when I was working on it, like as much as I was like, I was trying to put a lot of like historical details into it, but also you can see I like moved around the chair and stuff and the chair shows up in other, other panels. And um, I feel like that was, kind of what made it fun to do was taking all this stuff that was research and then like shuffling it around and making it my own. And yeah, that's kind of just like some of the sketches and stuff I wanted to show. I will exit screen share. And yeah, Sid, if you want to come back and we can chat a bit. I will come back. Hello. Hang on. <laughs> There we go. So um, how do I, I'm not gonna debate with myself how to use Zoom in front of everyone because that's not interesting. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I have a bunch of questions um, that I thought it would be fun to chat about. Um, the first thing that, uh, no, I don't need tech support. Sorry, I was just laughing at myself for being a grandpa. Um, <laughs> thank you though. Um, the first thing that, jumped out at me about this and does about um about kind of all of your work is that it has this really int interesting like exciting documentarian quality where um everything that you make i always feel like you're collecting something you're preserving it and it's like welcome to zoe's museum of the romanovs you know um so uh and often the thing that it feels like is being collected to me feels like something intangible like it's just a feeling um or it's like a just a, a moment um and i wonder how you feel about if you think of your comics as a kind of like record keeping yeah definitely um it was really interesting to me when you pointed this out because i find that like there's a a lot of comics making happening that's very like documentarian and a lot of people doing like diary comics which has never really like interested me like um although I like I'm kind of doing something now on my Instagram that's like more autobiographical I like like to have that kind of distance um but I definitely do think of it as a kind of record keeping but I think that it's like one of the tendencies I have that I'm always kind of fighting where I'll get an idea for something and 
I become like so involved <laughs> in researching things and sort of putting them in that there's this sort of like distance in it or like not necessarily in a bad way but like a stiffness to it that gives it a lot of its feeling and um yeah I think it's like sometimes what makes things interesting in the end um but also makes it sort of different from like sitting down and creating characters and sort of like making them interact with each other which I would sort of like to be able to do more um yeah um I feel like there was something else that I was thinking about this but it is so much that like there'll be something that I find in the research and I'm sort of trying to find out how to convey that and breaking down the pieces in like like yeah like the details that I find and stuff um of and and sort of trying to like reassemble all of that which then kind of reconstitutes itself I guess and it sort of feels like it's it's replaced the original thing um which can sometimes be like troubling to me <laughs> um it's interesting you mentioned um your like kind of Toronto real estate history comic as being autobio because I don't really think of it that way because it's sort of like um it's sort of like you're a secondary character in your own autobio comic in that one yeah I mean I think that actually is true like I was like it's autobio so I'm drawing like a little version of me and I gave myself glasses so like everyone will know it's me um but it's definitely like yeah when I'm in th when I'm in things I make it's always sort of about trying to get a sense of something that's like larger and that I can't sort of like pin down maybe except by making a comic about it because comics are these things where you're just like they take forever to make and you're like making all these little tiny pieces and then putting them together and they kind of make a whole um even if it feels like they're spinning out and spinning out which is I guess what I like about them and what I like found kind of frustrating about doing like painting and stuff or like that I wasn't like suited to it exactly that it was like you couldn't get that much scope of, of something and like pinning something down um by making a painting the way that you can with comics. I like that because it feels like um it feels like you can feel the process of making the thing in the thing itself, which I always kind of really like art where that, where that applies it. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of examples that prove me wrong, but I think it's more interesting when, when it's not made to look like it just, like it popped up out of nowhere, this piece of art where it actually, where you know that there's, um, that work was happening. Yeah, I feel like I'm trying to like embrace that more because um, often it's like I want to be able to do things just like technically perfect. Like that's very, very appealing to me, um, but is like not really what I end up doing or like, and yeah. well, I think also like when I would show like, cause I did art class, like I did art university school and like you'd always show people stuff in like painting class and uh, I feel like art school is like so much about that but they're like the process the process that everyone would like hyper focus on that and be like you should keep all the little pen marks on the edge like it shows the process or whatever um but and I was like no I just want to be able to draw so good but like I do th I think it's like leaning into that is a really interesting tension in comics especially because they're so like temporal and like thinking about that Toronto thing. Um, and I feel like the your stuff too, where it's like, I can recognize like elements of like your life. And a lot of the time it's like, it often seems like kind of a conceit that you are like making something as you go or like, um, but it's most interesting when it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, that kind of relates to um, my next question, actually, is kind of also about the, like, the sort of the, like, collecting habit that I feel like you have. Um, 
where you often, there's a lot of like images of images in this one, obviously it, it's like a lot of drawings of photographs, but um, like you pointed out, sometimes they're kind of directly a photograph and sometimes it seems like you sort of made them up um, or compiled them. Um, and that's kind of similar to, I feel like a lot of your uh, like zines and other comic works, it feels like what we get is kind of experiences that, that have been like filtered through a secondary device or storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that it works so well in this because it's an event that like historically was cloaked in all of this like mystery and misinformation where like even until just a few years ago there was a lot of um a lot of debate about exactly what happened on on the night of the execution um uh pre-dna testing and stuff um did you really were you really drawn to that like ambiguity and that sense of um like people have been arguing about what happened here forever yeah totally because i mean what like what really drew me into the whole subject, I guess, was like less that the Romanovs were very interesting and more like everyone's obsession with the Romanovs was very interesting. I mean, like also they're interesting, but I think like without this sort of whole like aura around them, it would like feel very different. Um, and yeah, like one of the things I found, like, I think I got onto this forum and there's this like, in the actual photograph that's like the one that this is kind of based on there's this like white chair the one that she's like kneeling on and um it's just i feel like i've maybe sort of lost track of the question you asked me but now i'm just talking like there are all these people on the forum who are sort of like tracking the chair moving through the palace and it really like almost felt like collectively people were like building this like mental space <laughs> but then there's this like huge weird thing in that because you know although they were maybe not so great um they did all get executed <laughs> at like a really young age which is like pretty horrible and like are these real people who have these like lives that got cut short um and there's something like kind of morbid about what like the fascination that people have and like more about the fascination with the fascination. So I guess it's like, I'm kind of trying to look, look at, at that a bit um, because I sort of had like hesitancies about, um, about like, yeah, like sort of feeling too in the story. Like it's sort of weirded me out. So I think that's where a lot of that distance comes from. And like, I think, a almost everything I do it's like I have that hesitancy of just like being in it completely yeah that's cool I like um yeah I haven't gone through the like endless forums or anything like that but it's like it's so weird because it's not it makes me feel like well but you're not actually obsessed with the Romanovs you're obsessed with some people you made up in your mind that like that are called the same names as them and look like them to the oh yeah completely yeah. Um, and I feel like you kind of took that and like to its logical extension and we're like, these people are fiction now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that when people are like writing about it, they have like an awareness of that. Um, but it is, and especially because like they were all very young, the children, and like they were basically like locked in a palace all their life. So like they weren't, I'm sure that they were interesting people. But like, there's not really a lot to be learned that I, like I tried reading a biography of them and it's like, it's almost like there's like people who weren't really able to interact with the real world, even though they're like surrounded by these huge historical events, which gives it all like a very strange feeling. And yeah, I think it maybe makes it very easy to like, be like, I'm that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... It's, uh, yeah, I find it really interesting whenever I'm watching or reading something that is like directly connected to history, even if it's like fictionalized history, um, because there's like a weird, a weird element of like, I know the twist, I know what's coming. I assume, by the way, for the purposes of this book launch, that it's okay for us to talk about how your book ends. How do you if feel you about If you don't that? want it spoiled, log off now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come back in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, we, yeah, execution, it happened. Um, so yeah, but I always find that really weird when I'm like, I don't know, I attempted to like watch Downton Abbey, you know, and they were like, why is everyone getting sick? And I was like, you have the flu. Like it just, um, it doesn't, there's often like a weird disconnect where, where they don't play as much as I want them to with like the fact that we know what's going to happen. Um, and I think that you played with that really beautifully here actually. So I want to compliment you on that. Um, and also like not only played with how history went, but played with, like you mentioned, there's um, a bunch of pieces of art about Anastasia specifically. Um, had you seen any of them before? Like I've seen them animated movie. Um, like I a Disney watched, movie? The, it's not Disney, it's, uh, what's his name? It's like the one where people always think it's Disney and it looks like Disney, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it's like 20th Century Fox. Right. I yeah, have yeah. seen that movie, that one's like a weird one because it, it also just like really goes off the rails and they're like, if I'm remembering correctly, they're like, what if the Russian Revolution was caused by witchcraft, I think? Like, is that what happened? Oh, Don Bluth. Yeah, it's Don Bluth. Um, yeah, we just watched uh, Rats of Nim, which was also him. But um, yeah, so I watched that and I watched the movie Russian Ark, which has a bit about the Romanovs, um, but is a movie where it's like, um, if you haven't seen it, it's like a one long shot, like the whole movie is shot in one shot. Um, and it's like moving through the winter palace and she's like going through all of this Russian history, but it's not like you could, I, a lot of it, I kind of missed and had to like, then had to read a bunch because it's not really like explaining it. Um, but yeah, so that I think like aesthetically and in terms of just like how much is a different palace, but like how much of the palace you saw, but um, there are like other things. There's like a million novels. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of avoided other things a bit because it just felt too much like um, it was gonna color what I was doing. And so I kind of like stuck with the things that I had mostly Russian arc, I guess, which I had seen previously to starting it. And I'm not sure that I would have watched um, if, if like I was already partway through making it. Mm -hmm. um when I feel like uh, a lot of the a lot of the other media that features Anastasia specifically um, takes a really different route than than what you've made um, in that they kind of all at, at least from what I've seen um, all revolve around this idea that was kind of basically a conspiracy theory um, that was kind of like propagated by um many people including like the Russian government for various interests but um but the idea that Anastasia survived the execution and then just was like had run off somewhere um and a bunch of people did claim to be her and claimed to be uh to have escaped um and uh I thought it was really interesting that the like the bulk of the book I was like oh is that what is that what Zoe's going to do? Because, um, because you know, it's narrated in the past tense, and it's and it's from a first person perspective, and um, and so I thought that was a really kind of clever way to um, to not make it into something where where your readers knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, actually, kind of using the fiction surrounding this person for for the purposes. Uh, of the plot. Yeah, it's funny. I don't think it's like, I guess, I think I definitely was doing that, but kind of I wasn't, I wasn't like explicitly thinking it through that there was, that people were going to be reading it and be like, oh, maybe she's going to survive. Like I was really familiar with all the survival stuff and the, like, yeah. just the little jewels detail is like very key to that whole theory because like, basically like they tried to shoot the family and like yeah they had so much jewels in their clothes that it like took them like it took them like half an hour or something like really horrifying uh to kill them and people were like oh you know they could have made it um and that it was like yeah maybe Anastasia or maybe like one of their sister had made it I think mm -hmm. um so I think it's like I I must have been thinking about it a bit um but 
I definitely like when I was thinking about the sort sort of whole haunting and the creature um there's a lot in that that has to do with like her specialness like she's like both in my book I guess that she's somehow sort of like chosen but mm -hmm in the stories where she's survived and like especially like i mean the animated movie is so much like this um and i was like kind of i wanted there to be this sort of like randomness almost in this really awful thing that's like sort of come to haunt her and that you don't really understand why or get um a completely satisfying like ghost story type wrap up and just that she's this figure that's like among all these and her family like they're among all these really big historical events and I was sort of thinking of the haunting as being something that's like it's like it's like indifferent even to these like huge like empire shifting historical events that are happening and it's just sort of centered on this one kid and we don't really know why so I like kind of see those things as being like less that they're like woven together like the sort of magical or supernatural elements and the historical elements and more these things that are like i was interested in them going in in parallel um i guess and i guess that was sort of a response to like a must have been somewhat influenced by the way that like magic works in the anastasia movie where mm -hmm. there's that little bat and stuff and rasputin it's a fun movie <laughs> yeah i should i should crazy be. story yeah i don't know if it ever even like entered my eyes i don't i don't <laughs> know whether that happened but i kind of like know i have a few images in my mind where like i feel like maybe they were talking mice i don't know like something like that or like a weird bat or something there's definitely a weird bat yeah um did you get into conspiracy theories at all like were you like here's how it could have happened I did a little bit. I definitely remember that I like read about them. I, I feel like they've sort of if erased some of them from my mind. Like there was that whole woman, there that woman, Anna, what's her name, who like complete like she was like, I'm actually Anastasia. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the proof that it wasn't her, but there was like, I I don't know. There there's a lot of like interesting stuff with sort of like hucksters. <laughs> um pretending to be her that sort of felt really separate i guess from what i was doing but it's like it's pretty interesting and and weird mm -hmm. um but i think they probably i didn't get too deep into it um yeah that's yeah. so probably best if you don't want to make that kind of story like if it's not going to be like here is a museum of anastasia conspiracy theories yeah totally um oh okay i have a different direction um which is that you uh have described this book as the shining meets sophia coppola's marie antoinette um which based on that description alone several people who i know but who don't know you were like yep i'm reading that <laughs> um like 100 uh and uh I feel like like film influences are are a big part of your work, um, and I remember we have known each other for one thousand years, and I remember um, you making at least one very beautiful short film that I have seen uh, when we were younger. And um, I sometimes think of comics as just being films that you can make while poor. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a question around that. I guess I guess I want to know if you're going to make a movie, but I mean, kind of I feel like comics. It's like, do you have no money and you're also a control freak and you like you don't want to actually collaborate with other people? Like, yeah. make a comic. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's like I'm not like a huge movie watcher. Like, I in wrestling is like really good, and I've sat down to watch it with someone. Like, I will get bored in 20 minutes and turn it off um every single time but like I did see I don't know my parents like kind of just like didn't really let us watch or have us watch kids movies so like I've seen a lot of movies that I think like make their way into what I do and like um I don't know I'm very interested in sort of like 
non-gory horror um that is not that is like gentle without being gory I'm not like somebody who can watch things that are um completely like sickening in that way <laughs> but like I'm always sort of like I a lot of what I've been working on in the last couple of years I feel like it's trying to like yeah make things that sort of like reproduce that sort of like horrifying feeling mm -hmm. um I do remember making that movie um and it's funny because I had like kind of forgotten about it until you um reminded me of it and like um yeah um felt... that was pretty like I don't think you had made a comic yet at the time I don't think so I think it was kind of like a weird pre-July underwater thing where I was like realized it would kind of be easier to do something similar in a comic and have like characters and stuff um instead of just like vibes which I think is mostly <laughs> what that was for anyone who doesn't know so we also made a really beautiful graphic novel called July Underwater a couple of years ago and you should like stay tuned for updates yes Zoe about like what's coming up like when you might be able to, to get it, it. yes yeah sometime in the future he won't be able to yeah. get it again um but yeah definitely I think that like I, I think that like I was reading like some Michael DeForge stuff today which mm -hmm. is so much the kind of comics that I think couldn't even exist on film like there's so much comics um I don't even know how that would translate um and definitely like a lot of what I am trying to put together is things that could really be just like little um film scenes but I think one of the things that's nice about comics like as opposed to, like film I guess a lot of the, I guess you would storyboard but it's like it's a very different way of like realizing things that happen and like you know starting with a script and stuff and um I think there's something like very like kind of pleasurable about being able to make what's sort of like a little movie on paper but you don't really <laughs> you don't necessarily need to be like planning and scripting it ahead and like it almost feels more like you can just like follow um the world of the movie comic um around as you draw um which I think like I don't know can make it feel very like immersive yeah, there's there's a question in the chat, which I was originally going to to wait till the end for questions, but it's true that it's like very relevant to what you're talking about right now. Um, or like, would you consider making this? Ooh, I picture like a like still quite silent, like mostly silent animation, you know? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that'd be really cool. I made a trailer for it. Peter, I don't know if I've shown you the trailer, but actually Paige animated most of it because I tried to learn Adobe After Effects. Uh, it was really hard. Um, I was trying to make the mittens move. Very challenging. Um, <laughs> computer kept crashing. So Paige stayed up really late and basically animated the whole trailer. So I cannot take credit for that, um, but it was like, yeah, silent. Um, and I think that'd be really cool. I mean, animation is something I don't, I don't know a whole lot about, but I think that also it's like a lot, um, a lot easier to sort of do like low animation stuff now than like where you're like drawing every single frame mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, yeah. And like, you already know that you love grueling work that you do mostly by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, where are you like, you know, sat for 20 hours and you made like five seconds of a exactly. film or whatever. Well, that's <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, um, I hadn't seen actually the, um, the kind of main, that like very beautiful Anastasia selfie, but, um, but I had seen um, like a, a handful of the family photos. Um, I especially, I love the colorized ones. Um, it's just, it's so, uh, it's so wrong and right. Um, the, like, I, like the uncanny valley thing, I guess. Um, yeah. I, uh, 
yeah, I was really like kind of put off by how by how normal they seemed. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that they would that they would not pose like haughty aristocrats, that they would just um, be regular and then be dead. Yeah, it's also like a weird t uh, period of time too, where I feel like photography, like you could just take like casual photographs of your family, because that's like 1910, but it's sort of even though like, it's not like they're dressed, I think in like the most old fashioned way, they're just dressed fancy, but it sort of feels like it's from an older Victorian world or something. Mm -hmm. um yeah and not like approaching the 20s I think I think that's part of what like people people like about them yeah is I don't know that it just it seems I mean it is just like the last gasp of um I don't know imperial Russia <laughs> but it yeah it feels very 19th century mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of yeah, in between times in a way that it's like really pleasing to us because we tend to think about like one period or the other and not really mm -hmm. the, the trans, like it makes the transitional moments a lot more exciting. Totally. But it's like, I mean, I think it's that they're casual, but a lot of them are like quite beautiful photographs that I don't know completely which ones she took and which ones other people took, but I know that she was taking pictures and like a lot of them are like, they're, they're quite beautifully composed. Like they're interesting to look at beyond being these documents, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like with with photography getting, uh, yeah, kind of like popularized or more accessible um, around that time, it's like maybe just the beginning of me being able to see a photograph and actually and act, begin to think about like being there. Yeah. Um, because like the worst quality of photograph is the more, I don't know about you, but the more my mind is kind of like tainted by how good our technology is. And I can't, I can't do the thing that I can do when I see someone's Instagram picture and like insert myself in there and think, I know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, a really old washed out black and white photo. I can't, I can't be there, which is very frustrating to me. Yeah, or then when you see one, they're like you'll find like an odd one that has that sort of clarity and it's like yeah. very striking. Mm -hmm. And I think the Anastasia selfie actually does have that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also feel like old washed out photographs look a lot like cartoons. Like the way that we like abstract a person's face is just like already happens. If yeah, just... where the eyes sort of become dots and like yeah. the mouth, uh, yeah, it just sort of becomes these like, and you, it's, you can often sort of see so much about people's expressions, but then when you zoom in, it's almost like the detail isn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they stay, they stay mysterious to you, which is, which is important for this story, I feel like. Yeah, totally. Um, oh yeah, so I want to talk about clothes before we start to run out of time. Oh yeah, clothes, I love clothes. Oh, I'm sorry we didn't spend more time talking about clothes. Um, I'm obsessed with the character design of the creature. Um, it's fantastic. There's something so like, I, I think fur coats are just like the most magical like symbol that you can draw. Um, you talked a little bit in your presentation about designing the creature, but I, I want to hear um, maybe what that was like for you. Yeah, that one came from like a bit of a funny place because I had a comic that I did like maybe, uh, I don't know, like a year before I started working on this. And it had a, it had a character in it that was like kind of like me sort of, that looked, it was like this monster and she's like running around Montreal uh, with her friend and she has this like big fur coat and I don't know, the, the eyes, but she didn't look so terrible. <laughs> like she was kind of cute looking, but um, I can't, I don't know, I was drawing, like I've, I've, I drew sort of a bunch of like proto versions of the character, of the creature rather, that like weren't sinister in that way. And I don't know whether this would like, it does sort of feel like this thing that's like the opposite of a human or something. Like it's, I don't know, it's this sort of like weird like inverse thing. Um, but I do find like the symbol of the fur coat like 
and the feeling of wearing a fur coat too, like a giant fur coat where it's like, I don't know, it's just like, it's so luxurious, but it's also super dead and like they're often sort of like a bit decaying and you know, the moths eat the fur coat, <laughs> it's the moth and whatever. Um, but yeah, like it's, it kind of feels like the creature, like I didn't go through a bunch of, um, I didn't go through like a bunch of like sketches where I was like trying to find like the optimal way for it to be. It just like, I just kind of drew it almost like I'm sticking with that, but it definitely came from this like earlier character that was not sinister at all. Um, and kind of you. And kind of me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it was a bit sinister, but not like that creature. Yeah. Oh, cool. I, um, so I will shortly go to questions if anyone has any. Um, here is your final warning reminder that in the next couple minutes, you should pop all your questions in the chat yeah. um, so that we can get Zoe to answer them before our time's up. Um, apparently, Ingrid Bergman played Anastasia Romanoff. Hmm. I gotta watch that. Yeah. Um, I think that this is the first version of the Romanoff story that I've ever seen that doesn't like heavily, heavily feature and basically star Gregory Rasputin, um, everyone's favorite disco song. And uh, I didn't miss him at all, which is cool. Um, and I really like that you were like, we don't, we don't need him. This is about, this is about a girl. Um, <laughs> And she is an artist and we don't need a scary man here. Um, was that an easy choice? Do you think about including him? Um, there were points where I felt like I should have included him, like just because it's like, yeah, the Romanovs, it kind of feels like you have to have him there. But I like really didn't want to put him in. It sort of felt like he was just going to overshadow yeah. everything about the haunting and sort of feel really connected to um, the creepiness of it. And like either it was gonna seem like he was connected to that, which I wasn't interested in doing, or you'd have to like do some like um, like character rehab and make it seem like yeah. he wasn't so <laughs> creepy and wicked to sort of make that work. Um, but yeah, he just felt like such a like powerful and like over bearing kind of figure that I just didn't really know how to integrate him and um yeah I don't know it felt sort of like cheap putting him in but I don't really know why it feels like he's a relic of a different kind of story than this kind yeah completely like he's a very he's a very weird old-timey kind of kind of villain um one side note coincidence though is that I was talking about what was going to happen for Halloween this year and it's my boyfriend looks not unlike Sarah Nicholas II and <laughs> I think that I could pull off a pretty halfway decent Rasputin. That's really so good. That might be what happened. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if I get it together in time. <laughs> oh question. Are your comics graphics influenced by the shots of filmmaking? Yes, definitely. I think especially like if you're trying to draw things in like limited um, color and trying to make it look effective, like just film is just on a practical level, like a really good place to go for that. Um, looking at things and looking at stills. Um, Cause for a lot of the rest of the time, I'll, like I draw a lot from reference photos and like, so many panels are just drawn from like weird shutter stock things, um, which are sort of lifeless and like never have any shadows or whatever. Um, yeah. That's cool. I didn't think about this like kind of beautiful old timey haunting graphic novel being like, like a picture of a chair with like. Oh yeah, my Google, my Google history is all just like man sanding man yeah. being soup like I don't know like just whatever um we have a I think this is not a question but a comment I loved how the revolution was visible only in a long shot where you had to peer at the tiny figures to see what was happening yes yeah that was kind of like what you were talking about where it was like the 
the images of images. Like that page was all all drawn from. Um, Is it real? Yeah, those are those are all from real photographs. Um, some of which I could find again, and some of which I'm like, I feel like I've lost that. It's like on a folder on <laughs> my computer now. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I loved that. Um, because it's kind of almost idyllic looking if you're not paying much attention. Um, you have to like, you have to kind of make yourself focus in on the on the violence in that one, I feel like. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of them, not not the one um, of the running people, but like a lot of the, the, the pictures that are sort of, I don't know, looking at old Russia, but there's a lot of very like idyllic <laughs> images that you'll find um, with the sort of something like lurking. Yeah. Right? I guess. Yeah. I also got a comment. I'm in love with your creation. I especially love the snow walk slash snowball scene and how all of that is framed. I read that um, that that really happened, that she stuck a rock yeah. in the snowball. Yeah. She's younger, but there were like little sequences in it that like a lot of it was sort of jumping off of, of things like that. I Yes, yeah, so I think that probably happened when she was I think she was like a child when you'd be more likely to throw a snowball with a rock in it at your sister, but um, yeah. Um, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, just like a, apparently she was a bit a bit wild. Yeah, I was gonna say people like seem to describe her as like, um, you know, like that one kid that you're like okay, can you just stop, like, <laughs> just take it down a notch, like, <laughs> yeah. Kenneth McMillan choreographer created a ballet in a stage show. Have you seen it? I have not seen that. I'll have to look it up. Like I said, I sort of avoided looking at a lot of other art because it'll just, you know, it can make something like an average of it all, but um, I'll have to look it up. Uh, what were sources plus imagination? I'm not sure what you mean, Peter. We'll have to talk about that after. Um, but, um, oh, sorry. I'm like taking over your job of uh, being the question reader. You're doing great. It's, I mean, to be honest, we're like equally qualified to be doing this job. Um, <laughs> uh, the, this, this is a good question about your choice of color scheme. Yeah, I think I knew I wanted to shoot blues for like a pretty long time. Um, I have like an old version that was that it was like just this scene that was in black and white, but I think that might have been more because it cost money, more money to print in color. Um, yeah, I really like the aesthetic of a lot of like risograph stuff. So I was trying to go for something like that, um, but not like necessarily like as bright. Um, the blue actually changed at the last minute because it was going to be like a lot darker and you sort of went for this more like, I don't know if that's a climb blue or what at the last minute. Um, but yeah, I think that that was a good choice. I think it would have looked a lot more like approaching black um, and it's sort of more like luminous. But yeah, the blues, I don't know. I think the blues were there for like a pretty long time. And it just sort of seemed like, it just, I don't know, it just seemed like the most evocative choice for like what I was doing. And I wanted to try working with two tones because I'd like used color in my last project where some pages were black and white, but I was like coloring directly and then scanning. Um, but I was like very interested in that sort of like flat color and also sort of making making the pictures in in layers which I think gives it like a very different quality than um, drawing, even if you were drawing with two colors directly onto the page. And now everything that you draw is green. Yeah, I'm into green now. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, did you, are you just sick of blue now? Yeah, I'm sick of, I'm <laughs> sick of blue. And I also feel like it just, it, it just feels like that project and now I, have to move on to a different color or I don't know you also just feel like get bored of doing things like one way like I I feel like I got to a good point like technically with what I was doing but um it now kind of feels like I want to learn how to make 
pictures <laughs> in a slightly different way to keep just to stay interested in it I guess yeah Peter wants to know when you first learned about Anastasia was it was it the the not Disney movie I don't think so I okay so I must have seen that movie um I don't know when I was like 11 but I was actually I um some of my friends from high school many of which are here today are all like big scaredy cats when it comes to horror movies so we would sometimes just tell each other the plots of different horror movies um, <laughs> instead of watching them and we had one friend who like told the jewels and the the um clothes story and I like couldn't get it out of my head for a really really long time so I think that was kind of this thing that like stuck with me and then I do not remember how I like started researching it for the book really like don't remember what the hook was yeah, by then it was two years ago. <laughs> yeah. We are just about uh, time. Yes, is, uh, I would say that they're all scaredy cats. What's that? <laughs> Never mind. I we're not allowed to talk about how about um about some of our friends who are in this this Zoom room watching horror movies with me because I've historically been um really bad about warning people when I say that I'm going to warn them yeah I think I've experienced that with you before. <laughs> like what do you mean it's scary yeah and I'm so and every time I'm like no I promise I'll tell anytime anything's gonna happen I will tell you and just like never yeah really bad don't don't watch horror movies with me if you're afraid I'll do it um, we are out of time as of right now, which is so sad because, and feels like no, nothing has, no time has passed. <laughs> Do you have any closing thoughts for us, Zoe? Um, just thank you all very, very much for coming. It's really nice to like be here surrounded by family and friends. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who like read the book and thank you to Sid. You did such a good job coming up with like really interesting questions. I hope we get to see you in person sometime soon. That'd be so nice. I know. <laughs> and uh, everyone, um, don't forget that if you have not yet got your copy of the gift uh, that you can get it from Conundrum Press uh, from their website, which I'm told is newly functional. So that's very exciting. Um, and, uh, or newly revamped, I should say. Um, you can also get it from your local indie bookstore. Um, you shouldn't get it from anyone evil. Yeah. No evil. Oh, sorry, Conundrum Press site is revamped, but not retail right now. So uh, you can go to IndieBound or you can call your local indie. Yeah, go to Tight, go to Drawn and Quarterly if you're in Montreal. They're all great. And yeah. Okay, should we say goodbye? Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Take thank care. Thank you for your questions. Yes, thank you for your questions. Hi. <laughs> there's one more, there's one more person still here. One more person still here and then Andy in the car. So yeah, I would say I didn't even get to Zoe and Sid both left right away. So anyways. Sometimes after being on for that long too, you just like, sort of like yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, exit. Yeah. All right. I'm going to head off now. Too. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks that was great. See ya. Bye. Bye.